All right, well, once again, uh, as we have done several times in this study, we're going to kind of go back and set the stage for something we're going to be looking at uh, within the lesson today. And we're going all the way back yet again to when God first called Israel out of Egypt, when He delivers them, and He calls them, brings them to Mount Sinai, and there He makes promises to them, blesses them. I've delivered you, I've borne you on eagles' wings. And now I am going to make you my own special people. You'll be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation to me. But required in that was that they would have to obey His voice and keep His covenant. The Ten Commandments found in Exodus chapter 20 are the basic tenets of that covenant. God who is promising blessings to His people, yet how can they maintain this relationship with God? Well, they must follow Him. And so the law is given to let them know how they can follow Him, be holy as He is holy, and therefore receive the blessings of being in a covenant relationship with Him. And so in Exodus chapter 24, the elders of Israel ratify the covenant with God. And the first thing that happens is Moses reads the law, reads the commands of God to them. This is the basis of covenant. And all the people reply, all that the Lord has said we will do. They'll actually make that uh, statement, that uh, admission, two times in Exodus chapter 24. Well, what we've seen throughout not only the, the period of the divided kingdom, but really throughout most of Israel's history, is a violation of the, of the terms of covenant. And we have already seen within this study, Israel went away into captivity because they violated covenants. When we go back to 2 Kings chapter 17, it says of Israel, the northern kingdom, they rejected his statutes and his covenant, which he had made with their fathers, and his warnings with which he warned them. And they followed vanity and became vain, and went after the nations which surrounded them, concerning which the Lord had commanded them not to do like them. This is why Israel has been taken captive by the Assyrians. It was not because of how mighty and great the Assyrians were, but it was because Israel had left their God. They had violated covenant. And so the curse of the covenant came upon them. Now, those who have been in our study, where does Judah stand as far as their covenant relationship with God at this point? You can shake your head and say it's not good, and that would be, that would be accurate enough. Okay, Particularly in our last class, we looked at the reigns of Manasseh and Ammon. And what did God say would happen because of, really, Judah had reached a tipping point with Manasseh. What was going to happen now? they have broken covenant. So God said to them in the days of Manasseh, I will abandon the remnant of my inheritance and deliver them into the hand of their enemies, and they'll become as plunder and spoil to all their enemies because they have done evil in my sight and have been provoking me to anger since the day their fathers came from Egypt, even to this day. And so Israel, who has violated covenant and have been taken captive, well now Judah has done the same, and so God has said this would occur. Well, all of that, the God's pronouncement of judgment, again, happened in the days of Manasseh. Manasseh repented, but yet it did not bring the people back to God. God was not going to relent the punishment that would come upon them. Manasseh reigned for 55 years. Ammon, his son, would reign for two years, but then he is killed, and so we come to Josiah. How old was Josiah when he took the throne? Eight years old. I tell you, that, that always struck me. And then when I had a child that was eight years old, and I'm thinking, wow. I mean, I wouldn't want it at 44 years old, but eight years old, now he is, he is king. Yes? Even though he was eight years old, even back then, wouldn't that mean they would have actually adults that would basically be reigning on his behalf? Yes, I think that's probably true. And we've seen that with, with um, kings of Judah really leading up to this. Manasseh was 12 when he came to 
the throne, although he probably reigned for several years with his father. Josiah doesn't have the luxury of reigning with his father because Ammon was killed. There were most likely, yes, advisors, counselors. Remember um, Joash? Who was helping Joash rule whenever he came to the throne? Jehoiada the priest. So I don't, miss, I don't think we would say that Jehoiada was, was making the laws, and yet he was the chief advisor and counselor to Joash. So I definitely think, yes, there were people who were with him. And perhaps the people who were with uh, Josiah as he began his reign were those who believed in God. Because what we see, particularly in 2 Chronicles, Chronicles mentions three significant dates. Uh, first, let's just look at even the language that's used of, of speaking of his reign. Look at verse 2 of 2 Chronicles 34. It says, He did right in the sight of the Lord and walked in the ways of his father David and did not turn aside to the right or to the left. Now, I'm going to make uh, maybe a point here using Deuteronomy because I, I think perhaps even the writer wants us to see this because it's going to be significant with something we see here in just a minute. Deuteronomy gave instructions for God's people in, in all sorts of, of areas, including here is what a king was supposed to be like. Israel didn't have a king. Israel's not going to have a king until 1 Samuel chapter 8. Yet in Deuteronomy chapter 17, God gave, here are the instructions for when you have a king. Significantly in those instructions in Deuteronomy 17, God said he is supposed to keep a book of the law. And that would prevent him from lifting his heart above his brethren. And also God said... He must not turn to the right or to the left from it. Later on in Deuteronomy 28, in this passage which gives first the covenant blessings, and then following that the curses of disobeying God's covenant, in verse 14, as you come to the conclusion of the covenant blessings part, God is making the point, these blessings are going to come to you if you do not turn to the right or to the left. You follow my will, you, you stay within my law, my blessings will come upon you. That is what is said of Josiah. And again, using language from Deuteronomy, he did not turn to the right or to the left. Then the next verse says that in his eighth year, so at the age of 16, and perhaps... This is when he does maybe become a little more independent. Maybe he's, he's taking more of the authority, uh, the actual ruling of the kingdom. But it says at that time, he started seeking the Lord. I don't think that necessarily means that he wasn't seeking the Lord before, but a more earnest seeking after the ways of God. And then it says in his 12th year, so the 12th year of his rule, he's now 20 years old, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of the high places. And Chronicles will go ahead and go and give uh, some of this purging that happens. We're going to consider that uh, later in our study today when we go to 2 Kings. Um, so he begins this. And then it says in the 18th year, so he's 26 years old now, Perhaps the most important thing that happens in his rule occurs, and that is finding of the book of the law. Now, it, it puts it in the context of repairing the temple. I doubt seriously that it was he waited till his 18th year to begin repairing the temple. Um, most likely that had been going on, but all this is put in the 18th year because it's at this time that this important discovery is found. Now, let's ask the question, why do we need to repair the temple in the first place? Why did, why did the temple been used for for the last 57 years? Idolatry. Remember, we, we made a distinction with what Manasseh did with what Manasseh's wicked grandfather Ahaz had done. Remember, Ahaz closed the doors of the temple. We're just not going to worship Jehovah God. We're going to close the doors. What did Manasseh do? Yeah, we're, we're going to keep the doors open, but we're going to put an Asherah in the temple. 
and we're going to make altars to all the hosts of heaven in the courts of the temple. So, and again, Manasseh repents, but as we're going to see, he apparently doesn't have enough time to undo a lot of the evil that he'd done, or if he had, Ammon had brought it all back within his two-year reign. So, the temple is not being used for its intended purpose, and therefore it is probably not being given the attention that the holy place of God deserves. So there has to be all this purging of all the idolatry out from it, the repairing of it, but it's within that time the text says that Hilkiah found the book of the law. Now, that could be the entire five books of Moses, Genesis through Deuteronomy, or it may have just been the book of Deuteronomy. But Josiah hears it. And what is Josiah's response? I heard somebody, I know you really wanted to say it. I heard somebody over here. Yes? Morning. Look at verse 19. When the king heard the words of the law, he tore his clothes. Then the king commanded Hilkiah, Ahakam, the son of Shaphan, Abdon, the son of Micah, Shaphan, the scribe, and Isaiah, the king's servant, saying, Go inquire of the Lord for me and for those who are left in Israel and in Judah concerning the words of the book which has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord which is poured out on us because our fathers have not observed the word of the Lord to do according to all that is written in this book. He knows we are in pitiful shape. And great disaster is coming upon us. If he has all five books of Moses, then if they've read Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy chapter 28, he knows exactly what's coming. If he only has Deuteronomy, all he needs is Deuteronomy 28. And to read, starting in verse 15, and going through a very lengthy chapter of all the curses. And, and Josiah could look and say, yeah, we've, we've had that one. We, we've experienced that. What's left? To be scattered among the nations. That's all that's left. Josiah knows, no, no, no. We, we, are, in, we are in trouble. We have violated. We have departed from the ways of God in so many ways. Now, here's another interesting thing. What does Josiah have them do? So they, they've read the book of the law to him. He knows what trouble they're in. So where does he send them? We've got to go inquire of the Lord. So who are they going to use to inquire from the Lord? A prophetess. We don't know anything about her other than what this text says. She is the husband of the man who would keep the, the, the robes of the priests. So there's a connection there uh, with, with the worship of God. But God is using her to reveal His will. Again, I'll go back to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 18, beginning in verse 9, God forbid His people from consulting mediums, spiritists, spiritualists, witchcraft, all these kinds of things. The things that the other nations would use to consult their gods. Again, you know, sacrifice an animal, look at the liver, and somehow that's going to tell you what your future holds. God says you can't do that. Significantly, of all the things that Manasseh is said to have done, that is one of the chief as well. He did not seek after the Lord until he is taken away into captivity, but rather... He consults the mediums and the spiritists and witchcraft and all those kinds of things. Josiah, however, you remember Deuteronomy 18, and we think of Deuteronomy 18 significantly as this prophecy of the prophet who is Jesus who had come. But God said, you're not going to consult any of these. Rather, I'm going to send my prophet. And I think there is application there to any prophet that God would send, ultimate application to Jesus himself. The God says, don't consult these. I'll have my selected spokesmen consult them. Josiah does that. We're not, we're not going to look any other way of finding out what the Lord's will is. We're going to consult 
one of God's chosen messengers. And in this case, it was uh, uh, Huldah, the, uh, the prophetess. Okay, so what does she say? What is the message from this prophetess to the king? Yes. Right. So it's a twofold message. The first part is the curses, and again, Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 28, that's the language of those passages. So God says, the curses that I have warned, they're coming. And I'm not going to relent. We're going to talk more about that in our next lesson, why that is the case. I'm not relenting. Curses are coming. However, for Josiah, he would die in peace. He would not see these curses come upon the land. He would not witness uh, God's people, his kingdom being dispersed. Now, Brother Steve mentioned on Wednesday, uh, having, or was it, was it this past week or was it the week before, when you asked about Hezekiah and about how he just kind of, you know, he was told he's got 15 more years, but at the end of that, you know, Babylon's going to come and take all of it. And Hezekiah's just like, okay, well, at least it didn't happen in my day. Um, I don't know why Hezekiah does that. How does Josiah respond to this? Because I think this is really interesting. Josiah has just been told, my wrath is coming. I'm not going to relent. You're not going to see it, Josiah, so you'll have peace, just like Hezekiah had been told he was going to have peace. What does Josiah do? Yes, restores true worship. He gets the people to renew their covenant with God. And I don't know if Josiah thought perhaps we can get God to change his mind. Or if he was thinking maybe we can just get God to delay it further. I don't know. But he doesn't do like Hezekiah. Hezekiah, who when he heard Babylon is ultimately going to take away all your treasures and even some of your own sons, and Hezekiah just said, okay, at least it's not happening in my day. Josiah gathers all the people, reads the law to them, and then renews covenant. The text says Josiah stood in his place. Uh, 2 Kings 11 specifies these two pillars that are at the, uh, the front of the temple uh, Jachin, again, my pronunciations are always so well, uh, Boaz, so these two pillars, that is where the king would have stood. So you can imagine perhaps the, the priests surrounding him, the elders of the people being close by, then the others of the people of Jerusalem, they're all kind of surrounding him. And so the, the law has been read, and Josiah says, we are entering into a covenant with God. Now, I don't know if I'm making too much of this or not, but notice what it says in verse 32 of 2 Chronicles 34. Moreover, he made all who were present in Jerusalem and Benjamin to stand with him. And then you skip down to verse 33. Josiah removed all the abominations from all the lands belonging to the sons of Israel and made all who were present in Israel to serve the Lord their God. I don't know if that means that there was a forced coercion into this. But again, what we're going to see on Wednesday, he didn't have the hearts of the people with him. There is a national renewal of covenant. But the people aren't being like Josiah. They're, they're not going to come back to the Lord with their heart. And again, that's why God says, I'm not going to relent. Disaster's coming upon my people. Curses are coming. I'm not going to relent. Yes? Um, when it says, like, um, all who were present in Israel, I read it um, almost as if he already took out anyone who wasn't willing to follow the Lord. He maybe moved them elsewhere or had them killed. That's what I'm imagining. That's a possibility. Uh, so... As she's, she mentioned, those who are present in Israel, perhaps you know, Josiah has kind of already whittled out the, the idolaters. We are going to see that in our next section here, particularly of idolatrous priests, that Josiah does eliminate those. Um, I don't know that he would have been able to, you know, he would probably had to kill the entire nation at this point to get rid of all the idolaters. 
Uh, there probably has been some whittling away, though, of, of those who are truly dedicated to these idol worship. But remember, this has kind of been a problem with Israel all along. Jeroboam began it in the northern kingdom. Oh, we're, we're going to worship Jehovah God, but we're going to do it in this way. We're going we're to erect these, these golden calves. And then Ahab comes along and introduces Baal worship, but Ahab names his children after Jehovah God. So Ahab's not completely departing from the Lord. It's fine to worship the Lord. We're just going to worship these other things too. And I think probably in the days of Josiah, you have more of that. People say, oh yes, 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 we will worship the Lord. But we've also kind of got our, our, our divine pole that we have in the backyard. We're going to go out and pray to that. Or we'll look up to the sun and we'll pray to that sometimes. Any other questions? Come, Yes, it's Audrey. I think it's, as Paul says, these are written for our benefit, our learning. That we, we look at the successes, men of faith, but we all, and men and women of faith, but we also see the, what happens when God's people depart. Uh, I, I think that's, that's the, the, the chief reason. And of course, and also bringing us to, to Christ and the need for Christ and all that. Yes, Steve. Amen. And this is all telling us why we need you. Amen. Well said. Brother Michael. Yes. Yes, there was, there was a recognition and that leading even to Jesus. You know, why, why are they so quick to, to want to crucify Jesus? Well, to them, that's a form of idolatry, saying, I am, I am the Son of God. You know, how can any man be God? They've, they've learned that lesson with various rulers of the Grecian Empire and, and Rome as well. Uh, however, Israel's problem was still not full devotion to the Lord. They, they devoted themselves to a law at that point, to tradition that rose up around the law, but it wasn't really to the Lord at that point. So they're going to have a different issue, but kind of related to their former problems as well. All right, I want to... Oh, go ahead, Steve, and then we're moving on.
we tr we're tr most of the congregation trying to forget that series. All 20 lessons. So I want to get to idols because I want to get to the, the final point that I want to make today, which I almost turned into the 21st lesson on idolatry, but I didn't, spared you, but we're going to talk about it today. So let's go now to 2 Kings chapter 23, and we're going to look at how Josiah proceeds to eradicate idolatry out of the land. And we're going to kind of go through these uh, somewhat quickly, uh, but you start really in verse, in verse 4 and, and go through a uh, significant portion of the passage through verse 20, and it talks about all the different ways in which idolatry uh, is dealt with during the days of Josiah. So you start with the temple, and again, remember, Manasseh didn't shut the doors of the temple, he brought idolatry into the temple. So they're going to remove all the, the altars and, and the images and the things that are used to, to worship those things, they're going to bring them out of, of the temple. And there's some interesting language here about what they do. They, they burn all those things. They're going to they're take them out to the, the Kidron Valley. They're going to burn them. We're going to come back to the Kidron here in just a little bit. And then they take them up to Bethel. Bethel's 10 miles north. And significantly, what had happened at Bethel in our study of the divided kingdom? Yeah, so that's where Jeroboam places one of his golden calves, right there on the border between Israel and Judah. Well, most likely, as, as Josiah has them transport all the ashes of these idols, this is going to be a part of the defiling that happens to that, that uh, altar, that, that high place that Jeroboam had erected there. Uh, so we'll come to that here in just a little bit. Now, it makes mention here in verse 6 that they, uh, they burned all these things in, in, in the brook Kidron and ground it to dust and threw its dust on the graves of the common people. If you look at the Chronicle account, in 2 Chronicles 34 and verse 4, it says it was thrown on the graves of those who had sacrificed to the idols. So it's not just any old person who passed away, but here are, and, and remember in, in Jewish culture and the law, What's a dead body? It's unclean. So we have now burned the unclean things and sprinkled them on unclean graves of unclean people. So this is highly symbolic. Highly, you know, the visual uh, ramifications of this would not have been lost on the people. He then, oh, that's right. So to give you an idea, just if you're not familiar with the geography of, of Jerusalem, the Kidron Valley is what runs along the eastern side of, of the city of Jerusalem. Thank you. And uh, Bethel is up here. So we've taken the things out and burned them, and then we're going to transport the ashes up here. Sometimes I forget that I have maps and stuff. All right. So we purify the temple of idolatry. He then goes throughout all Judah and, and tears down high places. And these are... Uh, some of them are, you know, community high places. Some of them would have been individual high places. There are high places even at the city gates. One is mentioned in Jerusalem. We're going to remove those. We're going to remove the priests who are serving in these high places. Uh, it says in verse 8, he defiled the high places. We'll come back to that. Uh, it mentions that he goes and does this from Geba. You look in the map there in that green section of Judah. Geba is at the northernmost boundary of Josiah's realm down to Beersheba. So that is at the southern uh, portion of his realm. The idea he is being thorough. He is going throughout the land, burning and tearing down the high places. Uh, then it talks about how he defiled the site of Molech worship. Verse 10. He also defiled Topheth, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, that no man might make his son or his daughter pass through the fire for Molech. And we talked about how a couple of kings, Manasseh and Ahaz, had done this. Uh, Topheth, to my understanding, is a word that means furnace. And so what it's saying is he went to the actual location 
where they burned their children and he defiled that. Uh, once again, your, your geography of, of Jerusalem, the Hinnom Valley is the southern valley uh, of, of Jerusalem. Again, the Kidron is here. Uh, once again, remember when Jesus speaks of hell and speaking of Gehenna, he is referring to this. He's using that to, to use the imagery of this place of burning and defiling and suffering and, and uh, abomination. This is what the Valley of Hinnom looks like that. Katie, I'm assuming it still looks pretty much like that. I know you're in here. Yes. Okay. So Katie, who is just there, can confirm that for us. Uh, so it is here that... Israel had been going and sacrificing their children in fire to Molech. Well, Josiah goes and he defiles that. Then it goes on to talk about how he destroyed all the idolatrous sites in Jerusalem. It talks about the horses and the chariots that had been devoted to the sun. Uh, so those of you familiar with Greek mythology, you, you remember that uh, Apollo um, is, is carried through the sky in this chariot, and that's the sun making its course through the sky. Well, the Greeks weren't the first to, to have that kind of an idea. The Assyrians also had a similar uh, mythology about the sun, and, and so you had these horses and these chariots devoted to the sun. And so perhaps that's where this has come into uh, the idolatrous worship in Jerusalem, too. There are idols and, uh, and altars that are set up in the king's palace. And again, of course, all the altars that are in uh, the temple precincts as well. Well, all these are destroyed. He goes and defiles an idolatrous site that dates back to the reign of Solomon. In verse, let me make sure I got the right, yeah, verse 13 it says, the high places which were before Jerusalem, which were on the right of the Mount of Destruction, which Solomon, the king of Israel, had built for Ashtaroth, the abomination of the Sidonians, and for Chemos, the abomination of Moab, for Milcom, the abomination of the sons of Ammon, the king defiled. We read about this back in 1 Kings 11 and verse 7. It says, that Solomon built a high place for Chemos, the detestable idol of Moab, on the mountain which is east of Jerusalem, and for Molech, the detestable idol of the sons of Ammon. Once more, our map. What is the mount that's on the east of Jerusalem? Mount of Olives. You're looking from the temple, you're looking toward, that is the Mount of Olives. I want to go back, I, I, I need to do this just seems like there's some connection to, to all the idolatrous things being taken to Kidron, the, the idolatrous site on the Mount of Olives. And is there, are we supposed to draw a connection of Jesus going out of Jerusalem, going to the Mount of Olives? I don't know. But it just seems really interesting that all this idolatry and, and these are the places that, that are defiled because of, of all the idolatry. If anyone has an answer for that, I'd, I'd love to, to hear it. But that seems like something... Maybe we're supposed to make a connection with it in the New Testament or not. Okay, just a few more. There's Jeroboam's shrine at Bethel. He goes up to Bethel, and he burns human bones on it. And remember, this is what the man of God, way back when Jeroboam first built these altars, the man of God back in 1 Kings chapter 13 says, this is going to happen. Josiah, by name, is going to defile this altar. And Josiah does. They dig up the, the bones of the idolatrous worshipers there. Significantly, they, they came across one marked grave, and who was that grave for? The very man of God, who had made that proclamation about what was going to happen to the idolatrous site. So they leave those bones undisturbed. Uh, but they, they utterly defile this site. And then, uh, yeah. Yes. Yes. Yes, that's, that's true. Um, he definitely made a, a, a bad choice that whether or not that had eternal consequences, I, I would like to think it didn't. But uh, he, he certainly suffered for not following the Lord's instructions about going back a different way, not stopping at anyone's houses and eating and drinking. All right, final one then, it says simply, he went through all of Israel's territory. He defiled the high places 
and slayed the idolatrous priest. And that's the point that I want to make. You look in this text, verse 6, when he, he grinds to the dust the, 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 the idolatrous things that they have burned, and they throw them on the graves of the common people. Verse 8, the text says, he defiled the high places. Verse 10, he defiled Topheth. Verse 13, that idolatrous site on the Mount of Olives, the king defiled. Uh, the sacred pillars he cut down in the ashram, and he filled their places with human bones in verse 14. Verse 16, when he goes up to uh, Bethel, and on that altar he defiled it, according to the word of the Lord. Verse 20, on the, the high places, he burned human bones on them. All this has to do with defiling. He is not just tearing down. He is defiling them. What do you think is a lesson we should take from that? It's not enough just to, to put aside the, the idols. Or to smash them, but they can just be you know, repaired. He defiles them. We as Christians, we're putting on the new man, and at the same time, what are we doing to the old? Putting it to death. We sometimes use the, the phrase of, of hating sin. I think Josiah is a, a pretty good example of someone who did that. He wants to defile all these places. He wants to make it where people can't go back and worship idols in the ways that they used to. We're going to eradicate this out of our lives, Josiah says. And I tell you, I, th I think that's one of the most commendable things you, you see about Josiah. Other, other kings have removed high places. Other kings have removed um, idols and altars. Josiah defiles them, showing them how detestable they are and, and making it that much more difficult for the people to turn back and, and worship those things again. All right, I'm surprised. They have, have they not rung even a first bell yet? Because we're a little behind schedule if we haven't. We're coming to what would normally be... There it is. Okay. Saved by the bell. Any closing comments or questions? We, we haven't talked about the Passover yet that Josiah um, you know, has them worship. We'll talk about that on Wednesday and get into some other things. Steve? Agreed. All right. Thank you, everyone. We will pick up here on Wednesday evening.